Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of The Mandala Effect. It is great to have you here, so thank you for listening. This week you're going to want to grab a cuppa and get comfortable. I have interviewed Ollie Anderson, a creative performance coach, author and the host of the Creative Status podcast and if you follow me on Instagram you will have seen that I was on his podcast a few weeks ago so we've already had round one of this conversation. But this week we delve into Ollie's journey and Ollie's story and how he came to teach what he does today. So Ollie helps people uncover their truth and live their truth based on concepts from Jungian theory similar to myself. We talk about his life-threatening illness and how when he was at absolute rock bottom, he was able to find wholeness and we talk about some of his other more mysterious spiritual awakenings such as the kundalini activation we go off on a few tangents and we have a few laughs but ultimately this conversation is going to help you trust life let go of control and surrender to the reality that you're presented with in order to make the most out of the beautiful life that you have. Don't forget to follow or hit the subscribe button to keep up to date with our latest podcast episodes and make sure that you go and check Ollie out either on his website, his Instagram uh, and his books of course. All the links are in the description. I hope you enjoy. Hi everybody and welcome to this week's episode of The Mandala Effect. I am very excited for today's conversation. We're going to have a very real conversation, I imagine. Ollie, welcome. Thank you, Rosanna, for having me on your podcast. Now I'm looking forward to see what happens today. We did an episode on your podcast a few weeks ago um, when we both made excuses at the beginning that we were brain dead and actually hadn't managed to have a decent conversation so yes. let's see what happens today so i'd like to put my excuse out at the start of this conversation because i am feeling a bit brain dead so if it doesn't go as planned or if i sound like a gibbering idiot or something like that it's because of the aforementioned brain deadness too much so, thanks for uh, mentioning that yes That's too much okay. coffee full circle and just a g- general sense of uh incompetence that's pulled me around my whole life that I'm hopefully going to bring to this conversation but anyway amazing okay cool so now we've got the excuses in um I mean if it really is rubbish what I could do is I could just take one of your videos and just clip that in superimpose me over myself yeah or olliception something like that anyway Um, but I'm sure it's not I'm sure it's going to be a great conversation and we're going to go on a journey but first of all, yeah. I would like to know who Ollie is in your own words. Well, I'll try not to be like sarcastic or anything like that. Let, I'll give an actual real answer. Okay, I feel like I need to be professional in this interview. This is a podcast. It's going out <laughs> to the world. My name is Ollie Anderson. I'm basically two things. I'm an author and a coach. And my main focus is on what's real, which sounds kind of pretentious. But to me, if you can understand what's actually real or true and work with it, then you're going to get the best results in life because the only place where things can happen is in reality. And so I have found through my own experiences and through coaching people that by helping them to clear away all the mental cobwebs or the hallucinations that they may be living out on a day-to-day basis then you can get quite quick results because most of the stuff that stops us getting where we want to be is not even real in the first place which is kind of controversial to say because we live in a world where i have my reality and you have your reality and if anyone questions reality or anything like that then it's kind of frowned upon but i like to think that when people say that what they're actually saying is i have my interpretations you have your interpretations and reality is just reality. It is what it is. And so if you can accept that, which just means accepting and working with natural laws that apply to all of us, like cause and effects or other laws, like you go on, then 
if you can accept that, then things just ultimately work out. So in answer to the question, who is Ollie Anderson? He's a guy that likes to ramble about reality. And in the spaces between the rambling, he likes to write about it and coach people. On it. On it, yes. In it. Okay, so so what makes something real or unreal? The short answer is that to be real, we have to be aligning ourselves with these natural laws that apply to all of us. Mm -hmm. And when we step away from our interpretations of reality and step into what's real, really there's two general principles that apply to all of us. And if we align ourselves with them, then we'll get better results in the way that I keep talking about. We'll feel good and things are gonna work. And those two principles are, we keep moving, we keep evolving, we keep expanding because reality in our ex our experience as human beings is constantly changing, it's constantly flowing. And so if we can live in that manner by having a growth mindset, not getting caught up in our egos and fixed stories and identities, then we've been real in the sense that we're moving ultimately. Mm -hmm. Obviously you have to make sure that you're moving in a real direction, but ultimately if you try to consciously do that, that will just happen as a natural consequence because eventually if you if you keep moving in an unreal direction you're going to get feedback from life that what you're trying to do is not real and so you're going to get friction frustration misery and then you're going to have to course correct anyway back in alignment with reality so ultimately the first thing you have to do is keep moving the second thing is you have to move towards wholeness constantly mm -hmm. connection connection to yourself connection to other people connection to life and if you can ultimately design your way of being in the world around those two principles, then in general, you're going to be pretty real because the only thing that stops you moving and stops you moving towards wholeness is the ego, which is the fragmented identity that you picked up and conditioned yourself to filter all your experience through that causes the friction and frustration and misery in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So how did you get how did you go from being unreal to real? Because would you say that the unreal is the illusion that we are sold every day, basically, that, that we buy into? So mm -hmm. we grow up, unless we have very conscious parents, we grow up to be mm -hmm. unreal. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think it's two things. Ultimately, anything unreal it's fragmentation, which just means any belief, emotion, ideology, belief system, blah, 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 anything ultimately that causes us to stop moving with wholeness or towards more wholeness. I think we all have a natural drive towards wholeness. But in general, there's two things I found that cause us to be unreal in that way. And it's our relationship with our, our own biology, so having an mm -hmm. unhealthy relationship with our body, where we either identify too much with our body and the way that it actually looks, or we have an unhealthy relationship, literally, where we don't look after it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we don't exercise, we give in to every instinct, every impulse. And by doing that, what we're ultimately doing is just feeding the ego, because a lot of short-term hedonistic ways of being in the world are actually about escaping. And mm -hmm. the only thing you can escape from ultimately is the truth. And a lot of people end up using their bodies to do that. So if you mm -hmm. have an unhealthy relationship with your body, and your instincts and all that kind of stuff, then ultimately you're going to end up being unreal, I think. The second thing is kind of what you're talking about, social programming, social conditioning mm -hmm. that tells you ultimately that you should be fragmented, that you should be disconnected from your true values, your true intentions, that you should have all kinds of self-limiting beliefs that are going to keep you fitting in with the social systems that we've created. So you can just be a cog in the machine and all that kind of stuff. All of the social shoulds that we pick up, mm -hmm. you should do this, you should do that. And if you have that unhealthy combination of having an unhealthy relationship with your own body and having loads of social conditioning that is going to stop you from improving that relationship, which means you're going to ultimately have an unhealthy emotional relationship with yourself. It's going to cause the ego to get a stronger hold over you. Then you're going to have a bad time. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of the work that we need to do to go from unreal to real is to just 
deconstruct all of that stuff the way that it shows up in our lives and then reconfigure in alignment with acceptance again of reality because that's the only thing we can accept was yeah. that even was that the question you asked that was the question but now i'm gonna uh sort of rephrase it and what about your journey yeah. from unreal to real well where to begin so <laughs> it kind of came in waves like ultimately i think every day ultimately you can become a little bit more real because mm -hmm. it's just about peeling away uh, peeling away all these different layers of fragmentation and bs can we use bad yeah. language on this podcast? you can use bad language yeah and, and I, I do mark it as explicit on uh, youtube so children okay. don't watch but it's it it's better not to use bad language if i can get some mastery over myself well anyway. but you know bs so you say bs mm. and i there's a i don't know bs also Ah. could stand for belief systems wow yeah, and a lot of go. a lot of bs is bs yeah if you think about it that's yeah, actually yeah. It. so that's that's how i use the phrase bs well i might steal that if that's yeah. okay you can have that one for free thank you but anyway it came in waves so i think all of us ultimately go through this process like we have to in a way because if we want to be happy then we need to find something real and align ourselves with it. So I think most people, the, the way I always describe it, we're born whole, we're connected to life, we're free and we're spontaneous and blah, 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 blah. Unless we have like a really, really horrible childhood, like mm -hmm. in our early, uh, early years. So we're free, we're spontaneous. We don't overthink, we don't hesitate. We just do what we need to do. But then at some stage, we get this little voice in our heads, the ego, which normally infiltrates our way of being because we've internalized some external thing from the world, maybe our parents, teachers, it could just be some random glance that someone gave us on a bus or something, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be something big, but something will happen that causes us to go from that state of wholeness in youth to a fragmented state. And the mm -hmm. thing that keeps us in that fragmented state is underlying emotional stuff, shame, mm -hmm. guilt, and trauma. As soon as we have shame, guilt, and trauma, that's when we start to disown the parts of ourselves that have triggered those emotions in the first place. And when we disown them, that's when we end up creating the shadow self, either consciously or unconsciously. And in response to that, we have to create the ego, which is a little box we live in, without all of these disowned parts, basically, or pretending that those disowned parts no longer exist. As soon as we've done that and we've identified with that version, the fragmented version, we are basically on the path to unreality unless mm -hmm. we change something. That's when it gets interesting because I think there's two ways you can kind of wake up. One, you have no choice. Something mm -hmm. bad will happen to you, especially if you ignore the call from your shadow self. And even though it seems bad, it's actually just a case of what I like to call self-destruction being self-resurrection. Because mm -hmm. beneath the surface of yourself, your shadow has basically created the scenarios for you to hold a mirror up to yourself down there at rock bottom and to say, oh, okay, like I've actually been unreal. And down here at rock bottom, all of my illusions have kind of disappeared. I can see the truth. And so even though things suck, I'm going to have to rebuild my life in a real way. So I think that's a very common way to do it. The other way, which I think people think is a very common way, but is actually quite rare, is for people to have some kind of spiritual enlighten uh, enlightening experience or something mm -hmm. where, I don't know, they'll just have some kind of an epiphany where they're just so overwhelmed by the beauty of life that mm -hmm. all of their illusions just kind of fade away and they're just happy ever after because they're so real. I think the problem with that is there's so much uh, BS out there, especially on the internet, which I am often contributing to. Um, <laughs> there's so much BS about spirituality being an escape from the truth, it seems. Obviously, you don't sell it as that, but it becomes like an ego augmentation device where people just end up distracting themselves instead of you know, finding out whatever they've been doing that's blocking them mm. from what we're talking about. So yeah, I think they're the, the two main ways. For me, I, and you can have both, I suppose. Like I don't want to make it a 
like a false dichotomy because a lot of the time when you are at rock bottom and you start to wake up the thing that speeds your progress back away from rock bottom i was trying to say that in a fancy way is some kind of a spiritual realization if you want to use that word ultimately i think spirituality is just about wholeness that's all it is mm -hmm. ultimately and the only way that you can go from unreal to real is you have to have some kind of a taste of realness of wholeness if yeah. you don't have that whatever change you do make is going to be short-lived basically yeah. so anyway i'm still not answering your question in relation to no. me i kind of had a combination of the two so i suppose in relation to like just the kind of organic spiritual awakening if you want to call mm -hmm. it that it was just doing yoga doing yoga and hiking they're the two th things where i had experiences where i just i dissolved like my yeah. ideas about myself whether it's at the end of a yoga session or on top of a mountain or something i was not there so the two examples i always use one when i was in japan i lived in japan for a while i was in japan we climbed mount fuji like me and a bunch of my mates and you climb up throughout the night and then you come back down in the morning on the way down you can see all the clouds beneath you and stuff like that and mount fuji because it's like a volcano a dormant volcano like there's loads of ash everywhere so you, you can actually kind of run down the mountain you can take like these bounding leaps go quite far because of the gradient but you just land in the ash and like you don't feel the impact so what that basically feels like is you're just leaping down the mountain mm -hmm. so that is one of the times where I was just like 100% in the present moment and it felt very real. So I was like, hmm, something going on here. And then mm. the other example of that is like in yoga, like I'm super, I don't want to say obsessed because that sounds very unenlightened, but <laughs> I'm, I'm a, maybe fixated. It's a healthy obsession. I know, yeah, I'm just trying to uh, sound clever. But yeah, yoga, I do yoga every day and I was going to say like every day I get this feeling of dissolution. I do. But to be honest, the feeling of dissolution at the end of a yoga session where you're lying on the mat in Shavasana, mm -hmm. the dissolution used to be a lot more powerful or a lot more potent, let's say. Like I still get it to, a, to an extent where it feels good and I dissolve and I'm whole and everything and blah, blah, blah. But I think in the earlier days of my yoga practice, it felt so much more powerful because the leap between the tension and the release mm. was a lot uh it was a much higher level leap if that makes sense like the yeah. gap between where i was mentally and where i ended up was a lot bigger but i think now because i'm on more of an even keel like it's not quite as potent but it's still there so anyway those two things basically put me in this state where i just felt like wholeness basically with the shot mm -hmm. of brevity so that's the spiritual stuff. But then in a more depressing, existential kind of a way. Human way. Yes. I've dealt with some health issues in my life mm -hmm. that basically just showed me like how shit things can be. Mm -hmm. Part of my French. That's going to be a, an okay. explicit little marker. <laughs> okay. um, so I suppose I'll just tell the story, right? So the short version is, and I'll try to be short. I, do I was going to say, can you do a short version? I don't know if I can, so you might have to reel me in. Short version was, when I was living in Japan, I thought that I had flu. That's the short version, right? So I was there for four years. And in my last month or two, I've been in Japan, my last month, I suddenly just had this weird week or two where things were just physically very wrong. Mm. <laughs> so I remember, like, I was in the subway station and I was like, walking up these stairs and i just got really out of breath like mm -hmm. it took me ages to get up these stairs like people were looking at me like what's this crazy foreign guy doing like crawling up the stairs and i just kept getting all kinds of symptoms like this like another one was i was in a meeting and my vision just kept going really weird like everything just got really distorted and strange and i, I thought i was dreaming or something i just kept getting all these symptoms and I just kept acting like everything was fine. I was like, oh, it's fine. Like explain it away as 
you know, I, I just drank too much last night or, mm. you know, whatever it was, just making these mental rationalizations. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And then there was one day I was just lying on my bed, my futon, because I was in Japan. And I kind of, I was just basically fading away. Like literally, I just felt like I was slipping into darkness. Mm. Like to keep myself awake, I was watching Fight Club on my laptop. And I was kind of like falling asleep into the, the pit of despair once and for all. And then luckily my girlfriend at the time, she got worried about me because I didn't been replying to text or something. And she just burst through the door, like uh, one of the Avengers or something. And she's like, you know, wake up, what's wrong with you? She took me downstairs. She'd had some mates with her because she was worried. They put me in a van and they like drove me to the hospital. And well, they drove me to like a, a GP or something, I guess. And, and anyway, whoever this guy was, he was a doctor. He did my blood pressure. It was like 200 over whatever the hell. And he's like, right, you need to go to hospital like right now. So they put me back in the van. I said this is going to be the short version, but I'm telling you literally every step of the That's journey. That's okay. Sorry about that. But anyway. That's okay. Just don't make me cry. Oh, okay. Well, that's actually my aim for the podcast. Okay, cool. Um, but cry with tears of laughter, hopefully. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so he said, yeah, you need to go to the hospital. Um, you're going to die probably. So that's a good place to go just in case they can save you. So I went there and started doing all these blood tests and everything. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And basically, after they did all these blood tests, they're like, oh, we've got to tell you that you have kidney failure. If you don't do dialysis, like in the next 24 hours, then you're probably going to die. So I was like, OK, well, that explains the symptoms. Like, I couldn't walk up the stairs because I had all this fluid in my lungs. Mm. I had fluid behind my eyes. That's why my, my vision was going funny. So as soon as he said, right, you need dialysis, are you going to die? That was basically the end of my four years in Japan, because yeah. ultimately I was in Japan for one month after that. But the whole time I was in the hospital, like mm -hmm. all my stuff that was in my apartment and everything. I had to uh, like my girlfriend. She was amazing. Uh, she basically got everything ready so I could ship it over to England and stuff like that. And yeah. I just stayed in the hospital. But anyway, so long story short, I had kidney failure and I had to go back to England uh, the reason I had to go back to England is because that's where I'm from. But also, I'll come back to England because you're in England as well, right? Um, yeah. So in Japan, they, at the time, they I don't know if it's still the same. This was like 20 years ago or something, 16 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, I'm giving you too much information. But anyway, they, they have a transplant list, but only between family members. So I came back to England. That was kind of an adventure in itself. I had yeah. to call my mum. I'm like, mom, I've got kidney failure. I've got to come back to, <laughs> to England. Um, so she's like, oh my God. So she came over to like fly back with me because um, it, it was bad and it sounds bad. Like, I mean, it sounds bad. Yeah, but. No, see, so you're doing like what I do. I downplay it. I downplay my shit. <laughs> don't, no, no, don't I'm not downplaying downplay it. it. Like, like, obviously it was amazing my mom came over, but like, they basically, they made me wear a mask when I left the hospital and I had to eat all this special food and they, they didn't want me to get too close to people on the plane and everything. Like little things like that made it seem way more dramatic. But anyway, I came back to England and basically when I was in Japan, my parents had moved. So mm -hmm. before I went to Japan, they were living in a place called Tring in Hertfordshire, which is near London. Well, kind of near London. They moved uh to the north of england where i am now which is where i was i went to school there it's very complicated mm -hmm. i moved around a lot when i was younger but anyway i had to call my mom like look i need to come back to the uk i've got kidney failure you need to find me a hospital where i can have dialysis so luckily my mom's kind of awesome all this kind of stuff she called the local hospital she explained the situation and they got me a slot and so basically i went from tokyo japan to bradford where i am now that was like a whole culture shift, a whole story. Like Bradford is infamously shit. It's kind of grown on me now. Like there's loads of cool people and like everyone's pretty real. But at the time I was like, what the hell is going on? Like I was in this city. It was like living in Blade Runner or something. Like everything's mm. hundreds of years ahead of its time, if that even makes sense. 
And then I gone to Bradford, which is like one of the most deprived places in the UK. There's this thing called the National Indices of Deprivation. I think Bradford's like in the top 10 or something. I, I don't know. Really? But yeah. So basically, I'm just trying to paint a picture of the contrast, the juxtaposition okay. between being in Tokyo and then landing on dialysis with kidney failure in Bradford. And to make matters even worse, when I was in Japan, I had kind of an awesome life. Like I was doing like mm -hmm. modeling and all this kind of stuff. I had a cool job in between, like doing copywriting. And I had a lot of freedom. I was just doing everything I wanted to do. I had long flowing locks of hair, much better than I do now because I'm getting so old and uh, <laughs> falling to pieces. But anyway, so I went from this kind of cool lifestyle where I was very independent, doing whatever I ordered, to suddenly having kidney failure, suddenly being in Bradford, <laughs> living with my parents. God bless my parents. I love them. They're amazing. But they did not want me to be living with them. They were like, you know, he's he's flown the, the what's the phrase? The rooster has flown the nest, whatever Flown the nest, yeah. Yes, were you a bad phrase. patient? Huh? Were you a bad patient? I don't know if I was a bad patient. I was terrible. No, do you know what it is? If I'm honest, I think I'm a paragon of virtue and sophistication when it comes to being a patient. This is part of my story. Okay. Like I've always been a fairly stoic individual. And if <laughs> I can toot my own horn, like for example, I eventually did get a transplant. I can go into that and I probably will as soon as I'm telling you my life story right now. Okay, cool. But I remember when I went for the transplant, the nurses were kind of shocked with my attitude mm -hmm. because I, I went to St. James's in Leeds. I just walked in and I'm like, oh, hi there. I'm here for a kidney transplant. And they thought it was funny because most people, when they go in, they're kind of like really terrified and nervous. In retrospect, I was just very naive. I was like, oh, everything's fine. It's just, it's always been my attitude. Like I remember once when I was in Tokyo, I am talking a lot now. I hope no, this is okay. how your podcast goes. I don't feel like I'm very philosophical. But anyway, when I was in uh, Tokyo, I was with my girlfriend and we were on the on the trains. The trains in Japan at rush hour are rammed. And I had this backpack on. I was getting off the train. And as I got off the train, the train doors closed. No, you yeah, were my one of those people. My, it was, my backpack was on the train. I was off the train. And then the train started moving and I kind of started like toddling along. And I looked at my girlfriend and I said, oh, this isn't good, is it? And like, off I went with the train. Luckily, all the people on the train were like, what the hell is this like foreign guy doing? They like opened the train doors and I could fall onto the platform. But the, the point of this, that little side story is that I just kind of went with it. I was like, oh, okay. I'm like, this isn't good, is it? And I was just moving with the train. She thought that was very strange. That, that was my reaction. But I think there's there's always been something mentally and emotionally wrong with me. And th these little incidents kind of prove that. But ironically, maybe that's helped me to uh, to navigate all of these crazy things that have happened in my life. I just have a natural, um, I, I don't want to say stupidity, but like a, a kind of numbness. It's probably yeah, from all well, the emotional trauma in my childhood. And, I mean, potentially. Uh, just... But it, you you say you tell that little story, and what comes to my mind is just trust that it's going to be okay. Ultimately, that is the theme of my life. Yeah, I could talk about that as well if you like. <laughs> like I will. So, okay. So yeah. you've you're you're having a kidney transplant. Having a kidney transplant. Back in and Bradford. you walk in and say, "I'm here for a kidney transplant." Yeah, let's skip to that part because yeah. there was a part of the story where. To be honest, kind of like ultimately in relation to the growing real thing, I hit rock bottom in two stages. The first mm -hmm. stage was when I was back living with my parents mm -hmm. and I was like, oh my God, all the freedom that I had has kind of gone for the time being. They were kind of annoyed in a way, not in a bad way. I don't want to slag my parents off. My parents are amazing for the record, but they were kind of thinking, right, we're, you know, the kids have gone. We can live our best life now. And there I was with my long hair and my weird attitude about trusting life and all these kind of things, but with kidney failure. And they were like, okay, this is not an ideal scenario. Luckily I moved out. But anyway, that whole period was when I started to, to 
have to wake up to the the ego stuff basically because i was in that situation but i was still identifying as the tokyo version of myself mm -hmm. so you know i was still thinking i was hot shit basically mm -hmm. but i was in bradford with no kidneys i took the first job i could find which was in this shop that sold like secondhand stuff mm -hmm. people would come in to like sell stuff so they could get drug money and stuff like that. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> and uh, that was just depressing. But actually, that gave me some fuel for my novel called mm -hmm. uh, Synchronesia, a depressing existential novel. But anyway, that situation I found myself in was the start of me starting to realize, OK, I need to change the way I'm identifying. Because actually, a lot of the problems I am facing are because I think I am what I was instead yeah. of rebuilding what I am. So I started to wake up and it wasn't all doom and gloom. Like my girlfriend came over from Japan and we had some nice times. And luckily I'm stuck because of the dialysis, but I'm stuck in Yorkshire, which is like basically the best place in the country. Basically and one of the most beautiful places in yeah, England. Yeah, exactly that. So like I can go hiking and all that kind of stuff. So it's not all not bad. And um, then I started doing yoga and having these experiences. I was talking about dissolving. Like, actually, that's when I started really getting into yoga because I'd have this crappy job in the shop. I'd go there and get shouted at by the general public all day and then go home. And no matter how crap I felt, I would do one hour of yoga. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, all that stuff was gone. It was like a mm -hmm. reset button. So the combination of yoga and hiking, it was like, okay, no matter what is happening, I can bring myself back from that state of tension to that state of release and move in a real way, like in increments, bit by bit. So mm -hmm. that started to give me a really solid foundation. But then, yeah, I had a kidney transplant. I was waiting for like a year and a half. I think it was a year and a half, about that. And then I got the call. That's when I strolled into the hospital. I said, oh, hi there, I'm here for a kidney transplant. And ultimately, that was a lesson in expectation because I had been assuming that I was going to get the kidney transplant and then wham, bam, thank you, man, all of my problems were going to be solved. I could go back to like Japan if I wanted to, could just, mm -hmm. you know, everything would be hunky-dory. Unfortunately, the kidney transplant went wrong, like horrifically wrong, actually. So after about a week... It was less than a week. But anyway, I was sat in the hospital bed, healing, and suddenly the kidney just started bleeding. And the, the reason I knew that is if you have a kidney transplant, you wake up and they've put like a drain in your side. It's yeah, literally like a, it's a straw like hanging out. Of oh. Yeah, it's disgusting. Because oh. like, there's all this ooze and stuff that needs to come out. Sorry, too much yeah. information. But for some reason, I, I looked down at this bag of ooze all this blood started shooting out so i tried to get the attention of one of the nurses this lovely guy called fred shout out to you fred i said excuse me like there's something wrong here and he said oh i'm dealing with the people who are really sick <laughs> and he marched off literally 30 seconds later i started getting really hot like really really hot i didn't know what was going on i was just so hot I like started panicking, so I stood up. The blood was shooting out of this bag in the side of me. And the nurse, not Fred, there was another nurse in the room, like a, a girl nurse. I don't know what her name was. But anyway, she saw me stand up and she's like, Oliver, what's wrong with you? Blah, blah. I tried to answer, but before anything came out of my mouth, that was it. I just blacked out and I felt myself falling to the floor. I heard her scream my name, Oliver! And then that was it, darkness. Oh, no. Next thing I knew, it was like a week later, I was mm -hmm. in ICU and I'd been in a coma and I didn't know what the hell was going on. My mum was there next to me. My girlfriend was there. And basically they told them that probably when I woke up, I would have brain damage. And maybe I do. That's I was going to say do. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I had had this weird dream, which is kind of a 
like when I was in the coma, I I had this vision or whatever you want to call it, where I was like a disembodied voice. This is getting weird now, isn't it? But I was this disembodied voice. Hmm. I was looking down at this mountain, and around the mountain, there were all these creatures going up it. And I was the voice in the sky <laughs> saying to these creatures, like little ant kind of things. I said, look, go find my girlfriend. Give her a signal that I'm coming back. And the signal, I said, make sure it's green. And then when I woke up out of this coma, I just kept shouting, go green, go green. And like my mum burst into tears because she assumed that was brain damage. And like my girlfriend was like, what the f- hell is this guy talking about? I just kept going, go green, go green. And like, I was kind of high on all these drugs or whatever it was they'd given me anyway. And yeah, so I woke up from a coma. And what had happened was the kidney, when all this blood started coming out in the bag, the transplanted kidney, I just burst loose. So they connected mm. it to your artery. It just burst mm. off. Blood was just going all over the place. Luckily, there was an amazing surgeon. I don't, I don't know where, who this guy is. I saw him one more time. Like when I woke up from the coma, this surgeon came into the room because they must have said like, oh, Ollie Anderson is not dead after all. Come and have a look. And this surgeon, he came into the room, the ICU. He was just staring at me like gobsmacked that I was moving. He just looked shocked. But this was the guy that like, basically when I was in a, co- when I collapsed, they wheeled me like straight away to the emergency room, sliced me open, took the kidney out, Gave me loads of blood transfusions, which saved my life. Mm. And then sent me to ICU. But this guy was gobsmacked. So anyway, after that, I was kind of depressed. Because yeah. for two reasons. One, I had thought that once I got a transplant, like I said, everything would just be fine. Like, no problems anymore. But So that was one thing. But also, because I had all those blood transfusions, basically, I lost, like, it sounds like an exaggeration. I lost, like, 90% of my blood or something like that. Wow. I had, I had, I think it's 34 or 38. I can never remember, but I had 34 or 38 blood transfusions. Mm-hmm. And normally, if you're on dialysis, you've got kidney problems. They try to avoid giving you them. Obviously, they had to give them to me because, like, I would have died. Yeah. And because of that, I now have loads of antibodies in my blood. So that's made it more difficult to get another transplant. So this was 15 years ago. Yeah, 15 years ago. And ever since, like I've just been on dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, waiting for another transplant. Now I feel like I'm not really bothered. Yeah. Then 15 years ago, whatever it was, that like being where I am now was like the worst thing I could imagine. I was Mm -hmm. thinking, Fuck, you know, like I'm gonna be on dialysis for the rest of my life. Might not even live that long anyway. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna like what is the point? I was like, what's yeah. the point? Like, me and my girlfriend broke up because like after that period, even though she'd been amazing, like it just got so difficult. Because mm-hmm. actually for her, she was more worried about dying than me, me dying than I was. And I was pretty worried about it. But like we kept having all these stupid arguments. She's like, you know, I, I don't want you to die. What if you die? What am I going to do if you die? Like, what's mm. the long term, you know, practicalities of being in this relationship? Blah blah blah. And how can you can go- convince someone you're not going to die? Like you can't. Like even if you don't have an illness, you're still going to die. So we were just going round in all these circles about die me dying. Yeah. And then I was, I was like, well, it's probably right. <laughs> like. I was like, yeah, I'll probably die soon. Like, this is a pretty bad situation to find myself in. That th- This sounds dramatic, right? But the the life expectancy for someone on dialysis is five mm-hmm. years. That's mainly because most people on dialysis are, like, really old anyway. Yeah, I've been on it for 16 years now. And yeah. at, at that time, I was like, there is no way I am still going to be alive and, like, 10 years five years whatever it is what's the Mm. point in getting married what's the point in buying a house what's the point in like i'm just going to live in the moment and just be crazy or something Mm -hmm. so i was really depressed because i was trying to figure out all that stuff and the way that i kind of dealt with it 
was through my work, like my creative work. Yeah. And so I always wanted to write a novel before the transplant. This is another part of the story I've kind of neglected, but like yoga and all these things I talked about saved my life. But the other thing that basically saved my life is my creativity because it helped yeah. me to process all this stuff. So when I was in the first part of this journey, I'd always wanted to be a writer. Like when I was in Japan, I was always writing. When I, you know, I was always reading about writing and reading books. And I just always wanted to write a novel. So whilst I was stuck in this shop with the, the crazy people, basically. Yeah. You mean the general public? Well, the general public, but also the manager was crazy as well. Like he, he was always going upstairs and I'm sure he was like snorting coke or something because he used to come downstairs and just yell at everyone, yell at the staff, yell at the customers. It was chaos. Like, don't get me started. Like I'll be talking for another half hour at least. Creativity. Creativity. <laughs> thank you. So one way that I would kind of process the shitness of my life at that time mm -hmm. was to turn it into some creative thing. So I started writing a novel and it, it, it's called Synchronizer, a depressing existential novel. The reason I say that saved my life is for two reasons. One, it helped me to start making the unconscious conscious. I could see what yeah. I was really thinking. That's the main theme of my work now. Like I, I keep talking about realness, coaching for realness. That's what I do. But a lot of the people I work with are creative people. Yeah. And my podcast, as you know, is supposed to be about creativity. I think you didn't really talk about creativity, to be honest, but that's what it's supposed to be about. That's my mm. fault for leading it in a different direction. But you could say that spirituality, creativity, yeah. there. That's the ultimate creative act. Yeah. So I take that take that back. Sorry, I was just trying to be humorous for humorous reasons. Hey, I, I can always bring it back down to like depth. Don't worry. Yeah, that's your creativity right now. So speaking of creativity, uh, writing this book, it did two things. It helped me make the unconscious conscious so I could see what I was really thinking. There it was on the page. But also it allowed me to make a mockery of my own emotions mm -hmm. so that I could handle all this depressing stuff I was dealing with yeah. in a kind of healthy way. And so my memories of writing that book, I just sat sitting there on a night after work or whatever, laughing my ass off, typing and laughing my ass off. That's all I wanted to do. That's like, if the neighbors could have heard me, they would have thought I was like a maniac or something. But it's because I was just, I was saying things you're not supposed to say in a way. And I was just, I've been so blunt, but in mm -hmm. a kind of poetic kind of way. That's just me trying to pimp out my own novel. But it's not for everyone. Like, a lot of people hate it. You either love it or you hate it. But anyway. Like Marmite. It's like Marmite. I should have called it Marmite. But I started writing it before the transplant. Then I had the transplant. And then after the transplant, I was like, okay, well, I, I need to finish this novel. I don't know how long I'm going to live. Girlfriend's gone. What's the point in life? Oh, the point is I'm going to write this novel. So that's what yeah. I did. Like, I woke up every morning, wrote, wrote the novel, and then eventually it was done and shared it with people. And they said, this is shit. What are you doing? <laughs> but I was like, yeah, they, they, they just don't get it. They just don't understand. And since then I've had like- That's some... like, so that's like typical emo as well, isn't it? I'm so, so misunderstood. I'm so misunderstood. <laughs> but I was like, okay, maybe. You know, this is just how art is. You put it out into the world. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was an important lesson because you, you create something, you put it out into the world. You think it means whatever. But like you have previously said to me, not, not in this conversation, but about tarot cards, for example, people just interpret it according to their own stuff. And actually, that's the, that's the real gift you're giving them with the creative stuff that you produce is a closer connection to themselves. Yeah. So now... I don't mind if people say this shit. I think that's okay. That's uh, that's good. I think I've had a few four star reviews on Amazon now. So it's been acclaimed in many ways by the general public. So it was all worth it. And um, yeah. So. So. Yes, you speak. No, go on. Oh, okay. So no, you've, got to finish, you've got to finish the story. Okay, which part of the story are we on? Because I've you're gone at on the little... you're at the book. The book helps save your life. So the book helps save my life, but there was a lesson. So putting it out there, yeah. Well, how can I say this? 
So in a way, what I learned from writing that novel is that I am kind of a genius when it comes yeah. to using words. That's mm -hmm. a joke. Sometimes I think it's funny to try and uh, come across as haughty or supercilious. But anyway, what I learned was that book, even though it was kind of real mm -hmm. in its substance, it actually was kind of emo, actually. Mm -hmm. It was me kind of feeling sorry for myself, but making a mockery of the fact that I was doing that. And it was very me. It was like me, me, me. It was very maudlin in a way. Like even though I was taking the piss out of my depression and it did help me, nobody is going to find that book as interesting as I do. Yeah. And so the lesson for me there was, okay, I still want to write, but I want to write something that is not about my specific life but is about the universal human condition now that does sound pretentious but it turned into this which is conveniently next to me personal revolutions a short yeah. course in realness this is when it's I it's not really a short course though is it well that just shows me that you haven't read it Rosanna because if you read okay. the introduction it says the book is called a short course because the long course is your life itself. Oh, that's profound. clever. I thought that was clever. It is clever, and I actually have I have read it, and I've started I've started the journal prompts, which is why I say it's not a short course because well, you get sorry, me journaling. I, I didn't mean to shame you for not reading. The book. <laughs> you get me journaling, and I'm sat there all day, so I really have to rein it in. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. That's good. But anyway, I started writing this when I woke up to the ego is not reality idea. This is so a how big... did you wake up to that? Well, how did I wake up to that? So I, obviously at this stage, I went through a process of resisting life, which was making me miserable, mm -hmm. to starting to slowly accept life. Like that big book is just about acceptance, ultimately. Mm -hmm. That's it. The ego is the thing that stops you accepting. Accepting. The only thing you can accept is reality. And eventually, I think the hamster wheel in my mind, I reached the point where I basically had no choice. It's like, okay, I'm going to keep going around in circles, resisting my situation, or I'm just going to accept life by doing yoga, writing things. And then I'll probably feel better. And so that was it. I basically, I kind of turned into a bit of a hippie, started meditating. I mean, I was a hippie anyway, superficially, but I became like a hippie of substance. And I, start, I was doing my yoga every day. I was meditating. If you really want to know, I had like this weird experience where this is going to open up a whole avenue of conversation. That's like, okay. I have a lot to say, as, as you do know. By Let's go there. Without doubt. So a weird thing that happened throughout this whole journey is that this is a tangent, but it is relevant. I kept seeing snakes everywhere. Yeah, you weren't expecting yeah. that. Yeah. Right? So earlier on in the story, when I said, like, I was watching Fight Club and passing out, mm. my girlfriend, like, stormed in like an Avenger and rescued me. Like I had a dream around that stage, like a day or two before whatever it was. Like I was basically in a garden. Now you could say it was kind of like the Garden of Eden, Eden, but I don't want to make this more biblical than it needs to be. But I was in a garden and there was a snake. I think it was a, a rattlesnake or something. I don't know, but it was a snake. And like it was the most realistic dream I have ever had in my entire life. Like it just felt so real which is what realistic means. So really yeah. that was uh, verbiage. I was using too many words. But anyway, this in this dream, I was just like walking through this garden and the snake jumped up and it bit me. Yeah. And as soon as it bit me, I woke up, like I was in, in this Japanese room on my futon and I was just kind of overwhelmed by how realistic that dream had been. Mm. And then when I got in the hospital system, I kept seeing snakes again. Like, because... You know, the staff of Hermes is just all over. Yeah, yeah. So that was everywhere. I was like, okay, why am I seeing all these snakes? This clearly means something. Then I kept getting deeper and deeper into my yoga. 
I basically became a hermit for like three years after the yeah. transplant. I was just a hermit. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just doing yoga. And then there was one night in the summer, a period of nights in the summer, I was doing yoga. And then at the end of the session, I was in Shavasana, closed my eyes on the yoga mat. My whole body was just like rotating. It was going all over the place. I was like, what the fuck is happening right now? And it just kept happening. Like maybe for like a week or two, every yoga session, at the end of it, I would lie there woof, like, like this, but yeah. like in my body. And were you just doing normal yoga, like Hatha yoga? I do, well, basically yeah. power doing... yoga. I, I do power oh, yeah. yoga, which is... Ashtanga. It's Ashtanga, basically. So anyway, yeah. Shavasana, woof. I was like, what is happening? Like, am I going mad? And then obviously I'd heard about sh chakras and all this stuff. And I, personally, I don't believe in all that stuff. But when something like this happens, you have to kind of ask a question. And so I started Googling. And that's when I found this thing, Kundalini. Kundalini. I just, apparently, Kundalini is a snake, again, which is the whole point of this little story. Yeah. A snake coiled up at the bottom of your spine, and then blah, 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 it goes up your chakras, and you become aligned. Yeah. And then, boom, like, after that, all your problems are solved. Yeah. So it's, I don't know, like, that was kind of a turning point. Yeah. Because I had not, I, I didn't know what Kundalini was, and here I was, being led by this trail of snakes mm. <laughs> seemingly to this experience and after that i got more into meditation i started doing kundalini meditation mm -hmm. where you do go to chakras and this kind of goes back to what i was saying earlier like at the start of my yoga practice i would just dissolve in shavasana mm. like i was gone i was connected to everything my identity had melted I was just one with like, you know, the universal ocean of mm -hmm. consciousness or whatever. It was very powerful. But now when I do yoga, I still kind of get that, but it's just less of a leap from one stage to the other. Yeah. When I first started doing Kundalini meditation, it was the same. Like, mm -hmm. close my eyes. I, I went through a stage, like every day I'd meditate, do this Kundalini meditation. I'd like a, um, it was a guided one to start with. Even like in a coffee shop, I could put this on in a coffee shop, close my eyes. I was one of those pricks that would meditate in the coffee shop in front of everyone so they could see me. But anyway, I closed my eyes in the coffee shop. Woof, there it was. Yeah. It was crazy. And the way that I look at that now, it was just because now if I do a Kundalini meditation, mm -hmm. that doesn't really happen. Like maybe I get some little sensation or something, but this sensation I'm talking about, like that noise I keep making, woof, yeah. that basically sums it up. It was like I've just been hit by it. And I think when I look at that, back at it now, the reason it was so potent then is because that spiraling, whatever it is, was just everything becoming aligned again. Yeah. Something like that. And now when I do it, that doesn't happen that because I basically am more aligned through my yeah. actions and the way I'm living now, but mainly because of the way I identify. And so that was just a weird thing that started to raise my awareness and ultimately really get me thinking about this wholeness fragmentation thing. Yeah. That's ultimately like the question that led us here that you asked me, right, is, you know, how did I shift into thinking more about the universal stuff and focusing yeah, on yeah. It. yeah yeah it was that like I got to a stage where I just felt connected to life and I started mm -hmm. trusting life like that's the something you said earlier right like the main theme of my life is trust like yeah. it really is like truly truly is like I think in a way right that if you look at your own life you'll see the the me main metaphors and themes show you who you are mm -hmm. and it shows it's shown me that no matter how we see ourselves as individuals we're not individually in control of our lives 
And you, know. you can bring God into the equation, you can bring the universe into the equation. Even if you don't believe in some higher spiritual thing, you're not in control of your own life because we're all interdependent. We all feed off each other. We all feed off nature, blah, blah, blah. I really think the theme of my life has been learning to trust that process mm -hmm. of surrendering to God, truth, whatever. And ultimately, when I was in Tokyo, living the high life and all that stuff, I felt like I was in total control of my own. Yeah. But it was an illusion. Mm -hmm. And in a way, whether it was my shadow self or it was God or the universe or whatever, I needed this experience I've had with my kidneys to actually trust life and to wake up. And there's a story I always tell. I might have told you before, I don't know. Like really early on when I was a little kid, there's like a metaphor that kind of sums this all up. And I use it all the time in my coaching sessions. Mm -hmm. Like ultimately what happened, I was, I don't know what time it was at night. I, must have, I think I was five or six years old, maybe younger. In fact, I must've been because when I was six, we lived in a different house. So I was like four or five. One night I woke up and I just wanted to watch cartoons. Like I had this idea in my head, right? I want to watch cartoons. So I kind of crept downstairs. It was dark. So it must be late, but I don't, don't know what time of year it was. Whatever. But anyway, my dad, he was sat downstairs by himself, like just watching TV. And he saw me, he's like, what are you doing? Like, you're supposed to be in bed. I was like, well, I want to watch some cartoons. And like he said, it's too late for cartoons, blah, blah, blah. I said, I want to watch some cartoons. So like to try and get rid of me, he said, right, I'm going to flick through the channels Back then, there was only four channels. Yeah. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have taken any long. But anyway, I'm going to flick through the channels. If there's a cartoon on, you can watch it. Otherwise, you're going to go back to bed. Like, he was convinced that he had outsmarted me. But he didn't know <laughs> that the universe was clearly working through me in that moment. <laughs> so he started flicking through the channels. And surprise, surprise, there was a cartoon. Like, my dad was gobsmacked. He was like, what? Like, he felt defeated. I, I could tell. That yeah. probably uh, explains our relationship for the rest of our time together. But anyway, like he flicked through channels, there was a cartoon on the TV. That is uh, the kind of synchronicity, maybe. Yeah. But in relation to all this stuff I'm rambling about, the cartoon is an image that has stuck with me my whole life. And I've been trying to find it. I've never found it. So if anyone finds this cartoon, please let me know. We but need some more information about the cartoon. Yeah, I know. I was trying to like build suspense. <laughs> but engagement but anyway uh, this cartoon it was like it was just like a blue and white cartoon so it was very Popeye. simple no it wasn't Popeye like basically what it was there was like this baby walking in the sky <laughs> uh, like the baby was like trying to walk between these two mountains or something like that and it was just like empty space like the sky but every time the baby took a step, like bricks would appear underneath its feet and a bridge was built. And then um... it took another step and then another one and another one and another one. And if I understand it right, that is basically a metaphor for trust. Yeah. And that is actually how I try to live now, like, like that baby on the bridge. And in relation to all this stuff I'm talking about, going through this sub story about mm. kidneys and everything, led me to that same place because the only way I was able to get out of my head mm -hmm. and stop resisting and beat myself up and blah, blah, blah was to start trusting like that baby on the bridge. Mm -hmm. And it's the difference between flowing with life and forcing life. Yeah. Forcing life is ego. You can't force life. If that baby had been trying to force life, it would have fallen down to the bottom of a ravine and it would be dead. Mm -hmm. The trust is the key thing. And you can only trust one thing, reality, truth. Mm -hmm. And so either, like I didn't do it consciously, but just as a natural consequence of 
accepting that it is what it is, it led to that place of trust. Mm -hmm. And it's always a work in progress. Like this year, really, I have learned to trust more than ever. And it's mainly because I just peeled another layer of the onion. And like with my business, I felt like I was, sometimes I was just working for the sake of working. You know, yeah. like when you're self-employed, you always have a plan, but you don't really know what you're doing a lot of the time. No. And you really have to trust. Yeah, you really have to trust. But like a lot, my response to not knowing what to do was to like concoct a little plan about, you know, I'm going to take these steps and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow it. It never, it never worked ever. No, and then no, I, but we sort of need that a little bit. Well, you, yeah, you do. 100% you do. But what you actually need, I have learned, you need the vision. You need to know where you're going. Mm -hmm. That baby on the bridge, it knew it was going to do the side. That's all you actually need to know. And so I know, right, in my business, I want to do this, I want to do that. I want to help these people, blah, 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 blah. And so instead of trying to force everything, what I mean by forcing everything is like some days you wake up, you go to the computer and you're like, okay, I don't really know what to do right now. Like, okay. That's why. I and then you think, okay, I don't know what to do. So I'm going to do what everyone thinks you should do. I'm going to make some content. I'm going to send some email. Do you know, you, you start forcing things. I woke up to the fact that that is just bullshit. It's pointless. It's totally pointless. And so now I think it's better to do nothing and let inspiration come. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's better to, like, honestly, if you, if you work for yourself and you find yourself just typing away or whatever for the sake of it, close the computer, go for a walk, meditate, call someone, sit, whatever it is, right? Anything is better than that because mm -hmm. then the next steps are going to just arise naturally or you're going to have some synchronicity or whatever it is where because you've gone for a walk or something, you're going to see something that answers your question about what to actually do. Next. It's mm -hmm. weird. When you get out of the, the ego of forcing everything mindset, you become open to interdependence. It's yeah. all interdependence. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but that's where most people fall down. Yes, because of the they, trust. Yeah, because they believe that they are the ego. Exactly that. Exactly that. And so I suppose one thing we haven't really talked about is with the ego stuff, it's always basically life is simple, right? It really is. We complicate it with the ego. Oh, yeah. If people are forcing life because of all the reasons we're talking about, ego mm -hmm. stuff, the only reason you do that is because you are disconnected from the truth at some level. Mm -hmm. The only thing that keeps people in that state of disconnection is unresolved shame, ultimately. That's mm -hmm. it. They're shame-driven. When you're shame-driven, you feel like you have to control everything to not trigger the shame in any way, shape, or form. You need to control mm -hmm. that. And so, ultimately, you have to wake up to the fact that shame doesn't need to exist. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. then you can put yourself on this path of trusting. I took that in a whole different direction. Yeah, but that's okay because I, I mean, so I'm, as you know, writing my book at the moment and I realize how much shame has driven yeah, my yeah. life. Yeah, but, yeah. Peep, but the everyday person doesn't really know that. And yeah. so especially in this spiritual world where yeah. we are kind of driven by this spiritual ego, you know, until yeah, you yeah. really do have this wake up call, we try to control through manifestation. Yeah. 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 And that's where yeah. I was for such a long time trying yeah. to control through manifestation, but that ultimately <laughs> is, it, it, yeah. it is yeah. trying to control life. And I recorded a video earlier about this, like, uh, yeah, I watched that video. Oh, yeah. no, you didn't. No, you didn't, because it's not out yet. You may, yeah, but you, I'm sure you mentioned something on your YouTube about this. Yeah, I know. I sometimes sound like a broken record, but um, but about trying to control life. Yeah. And yeah. we, 
it is the hardest thing to get your head around is that you are not in control yeah it doesn't yeah. you know it whatever it is the the force that is in control is whatever makes the flowers bloom yeah whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever makes the rain fall if mm. do we really think that as <laughs> humans that we can control what happens in our lives yeah it's so true like i'm kind of laughing because when you when we speak of the truth in these terms it sounds crazy don't it? like if you say if you go to the average guy in the street and you say well my plan for living a happy life is just to trust the force that makes the rain fall and the flowers bloom <laughs> and if i do that well my business is going to be better and life's just going to be better in general it sounds like it sounds crazy but that is actually yeah. the truth that's it but then what if we have some people have so much trust well this is no direction well yes this is why i said you need the vision the baby need, on, on the bridge yeah. it needs to know that it's going to the other side mm -hmm. you can become so open-minded and so trusting that your brains fall out but that is ego and it's ego because it's an avoidance of responsibility mm -hmm. people think I was going to go to run. I'll tell you a story that is going to be like 10 minutes short. So <laughs> <laughs> there's this story. I don't know if I said this when you were on my podcast. So I'm a broken record as well. But anyway, the story is there's two guys in the desert. Did I tell you this? There's two guys in the desert. Yeah. They're tying up their camels for the night because they're getting ready to camp. And even though I just said they both tying up the camels, they're not. One guy ties up his camel, he ties it to a post. The other guy, he is so trusting of the Lord above that he decides he's not going to tie up his camel. Mm -hmm. The guy who ties up his camel sees his irrational friend. He's like, why aren't you tying up your camel? Like, it's going to wander off into the desert and you'll never see it again. So the, the guy who refuses to tie up his camel, he says, well, actually, I trust God, so I don't need to tie my camel up. Keep uh, your nose out of my business and uh, leave me alone. So he, they both go to bed, one guy tying it up, the other guy not tying it up, wake up the next morning, what has happened? I'm trying to involve you in the story. Oh, okay, I need to, okay, so the camel has wandered off. They, what a surprise, right? The camel wandered off. And so the guy, an, an animal with no, not much consciousness, <laughs> was followed its didn't it? followed its instinct. exactly that. So the guy who still has his camel, he's like happy, obviously. The other guy is distraught. He said, "Oh my god, I can't believe it! Like God didn't save my camel from wandering off." Blah 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 blah. And the guy with the camel, he says, "Well, why should God do for you what you can do for yourself?" And that is the core of this issue that you're talking about. Because a lot of people, they use the law of attraction, spirituality, whatever else you can name, basically. They'll use it as a way of avoiding taking action. Mm -hmm. Action is a very good thing. Action is the only thing that will actually ever change your life. Yeah. But the thing is, if you take real action or inspired action, well, that's when the universe and the power behind all things that makes the rainfall on the flowers is going to support you in your goals. Because the actions you'll be taking, because you've been through a process of awareness and acceptance first, are going to be aligned with the whole, with the way things are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so you have to take action. If you don't take action, it's almost always because of the shame thing you were talking about. People mm -hmm. don't want to take action because they have too much unresolved shame, mm -hmm. basically. But even if you do take action, you can't control everything, obviously. So you have to take action without taking action. The, the Wu Wei thing, outcome independence that is the only way to live and you can only do that with trust it's the only real and, way to live i would say and, and so how can people start to work with this unresolved shame you have to find a way to taste and experience your true identity in realness what that means ultimately is you find the edge the edge is what i like to call the place where your ego meets reality and you'll have a moment of dissolution so i've already mm -hmm. talked about a few right for me doing yoga <sighs> dissolved mind identity wholeness 
Mm-hmm. Body, it all becomes one. Yeah. Maybe climbing a mountain, making love, ride a motorbike too fast, play the guitar. It doesn't matter. It can be anything, actually. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. But you can find ways to taste wholeness. And when we say tasting wholeness, it's not a separate thing. That's the point. You are wholeness. That is your true identity. You are not any label, concept, fragmentation. You're not your body. You are wholeness. You'll have a moment, or you can have moments, and we've all had them, but we Mm -hmm. think it's just some novel little thing. You have a moment where, this sounds, sounds really pretentious, but you blur the boundaries between objects and subjects. And mm-hmm. all that means, if nobody knows, is like the, the objects of your experience, you being the subject, they, there is no distinction between the two. It's one system. You transcend mm-hmm. all of the fragmentary bullshit that holds us back in life, and you, you feel very alive. What most people do, though, when they taste those moments is they just say, oh, that was nice. And, uh, you know, they go collect some shopping bags or whatever it is. (laughs) And they just get on with they just get back on the hamster wheel of the same old bullshit. Yeah. You can't live in those that space all the time because we are fragmented in our bodies here, Mm -hmm. here on planet Earth. But. If you taste it, you always know what direction to move in. The mm-hmm. other thing that's maybe more practical is what you keep saying about vision. Yeah. You figure out a real vision for your life. The process I always talk about, awareness, acceptance, and action. You mm-hmm. raise awareness, your ego, how it's holding you back, what is keeping you from. You start to accept the truth about yourself, the world, mm-hmm. and reality. By doing that, you'll figure out your true values, your true intentions. Then you can act, and you can start bringing the things into your life through action that you really want. And the law of attraction comes into this because I think the law of attraction works, but also I mean, it's the law of the universe. It's it's, exactly right. Like people call it the law of attraction, but actually it's just aligning yourself with God. I'm trying to use the word God more often because I used to really fear that word, mm. but it's just a word. But anyway, yeah. aligning yourself with the will of how things are ultimately. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the time when people start using the law of attraction, or when people start getting spiritual, they're only doing it because they want something from life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people say, right, I want a Lamborghini. I want a hot new girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. I want X. And all this forcing I'm doing to try and get this thing is not working. So I'm going to start praying. (laughs) I'm going to start meditating. I'm going to become spiritual. I'm going to use the law of attraction. Because they're doing that in an unreal way, Mm -hmm. either they don't get what they want or they do get what they want and they're not ready for it. So it will, it ruins their life or, you know, they just end up losing it. And then it's like what they say about lottery winners, isn't it? You have to kind of, you have to be, I don't know, comfortable you have to kind of raise your awareness to be able to cope with that yeah, exactly it's right. like everything that i was asking for yeah before i had cancer yeah. i wasn't ready for it in yeah, any exactly. way shape or form at the start when we're using the law of attraction or, or any other spiritual thing like that at the start of the journey it's because we have shame like mm-hmm. we're trying to whatever we're asking for it's ultimately a unicorn that we're trying to use mm-hmm. to fill the void. It's like, right, if I get this partner, if I get this, get that, I'll be healed. I won't feel the shame and I won't be driven by it. Mm-hmm. What actually happens, if you're lucky, is you get to the point where you realize it actually doesn't matter what shit you bring into your life. Your inner feeling of realness and wholeness will never change. You can't add to it. You can't remove from it, subtract from it. And as long as you're connected to that, the inner will eventually be reflected in the outer. And so that just means that a lot of this stuff you start asking for before you've raised awareness and acceptance of yourself, which always leads to wholeness, a lot of the stuff you're asking for, you won't want anyway. And you'll start asking for things that are real because they're aligned with the nature of the universe or whatever word we're going to use. And then you, it'll start working. 
But to get there, you have to trust. A tr trust and align with wholeness. That's basically it. That's it. So that's how we complete life, right? Ultimately, yeah. and then you die. And then and you die, and then you then start you return to, to complete wholeness. If you think about it. Yeah. It's quite nice, really, in life. I recommend it. Yeah, it is. Well, I think that that's an excellent place to kind of wrap this, <laughs> wrap yes. up this conversation. I think you've 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 completed uh, you've completed life. So there you go. I don't know if you, I should say it like that. That sounds a bit morbid. <laughs> and just uh, and and your books I don't. I don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, I. This has been a good conversation. Yeah. Because I mainly got to talk about me. You've spoken about and, and the, the things that I believe in, and um, I think that was all right. Yeah. Yeah. Was it? No, it was. It I matter. I really enjoyed it because, like I said, I've read your book Shadow Life, and I've started a uh, personal. Is it revolutions? Revolutions, yes. Yeah. That, that sounds. I like get confused. Yeah. Is it revolutions or revelations? Yeah, revolutions. it's revolutions. Yeah. Somebody who had really started reading it would surely know. No, it's like a it's like a <laughs> trick in my mind. It's I like don't... my mind can't get it right. But yeah. because I and I've said that when I read Shadow Life, like it just really helped read a real mm. um experience like because I read spiritual books, right? In fact, my laptop right now is resting on the autobiography of a yogi. Normally it rests mm -hmm. on the book of symbols. And you know, these books are not like books but to read a light book about a very real human mm. thing is and spiritual thing was really helpful for me and just hearing somebody else's you know I see a lot of my story and yours and the awakening the awakening thing and it's sometimes nice to know that you're not alone well thank you for yeah. reading that book thank like, you. ultimately that's all this stuff to talk about I'm trying to just look at what is universal for us all mm -hmm. like personal revolutions is like a big ass book you've seen it no one ever really finishes that book that's why i wrote shadow life because yeah. it's so it's, it's basically an abridged version like all of those things that it breaks down shame guilt and trauma blah 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 blah. that's oh, a cat that's um He's just open the door did you not see that's kind of badass <laughs> anyway they're like the basic building blocks that apply to all of us and if you can understand that yeah then life gets better and I know you're trying to wrap up, but one thing I didn't say that I started saying, the reason I started writing personal revolutions and everything is because when I wrote my novel, it was so me, 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 that yeah. I was like, okay, that is not going to add value to the world. The only way anyone, any of us can add value is looking at our own stuff and then trying to make it universal. And so I think that is another big part of the puzzle. You get to mm -hmm. that point where you you look at your own shit and you go through whatever you're going through but the lessons are always the same. It's like, this is what's real. And it, all of us really, like as coaches or whatever, like we're Jungian coaches. Yeah. That's what you, we, um, even though you don't talk about Kalyan. I was going to say, we haven't even mentioned Jung. Yeah. But anyway, like it's all the same. We're all just looking at the same reality and then saying, right, this is my way into it. This is here. Do something with it for your own yeah. life. Yeah. But yeah, that's, I don't know what that means, but that's what I just said. But it is help like that is helpful because um my mind's just gone completely blank. This did you did you see him open the door? No, I just saw his like nose appear into the shop. <laughs> He's been scratching at the door for an hour. I'll edit it. No, that it looks good. I think that should be it. Like it's very aesthetic. <laughs> he is very aesthetic and he knows it. Um see now you've got me, I've gone totally brain dead. <laughs> well, we did warn people that might happen. We did warn people that might happen, but in short, this has been an awesome conversation and thank you for joining me. I'm going to link all of your books below. Thank you for that. Below in the description and in the show notes and how people can find you. But can you just kind of summarize what we've spoken about very quickly yeah i'm glad you said very quickly to help people who are going through yeah uh, some shit right now the quickest way to say it, uncover the truth live the truth there you go that's it that's literally all we're talking about 
That's it. And if something okay. shit is happening to you, something bad, the truth will make it easier to deal with because you won't resist it. It's the illusions that stop you from going with it. There you go. That's it. Done. Completed. Wow. Feels good. Thank you. Thank you. Like I've been Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of The Mandala Effect. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. I greatly appreciate your ongoing support and the podcast wouldn't be where it is today without you. So thank you. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends and family and let's continue spreading the mandala effects of magic and infinite possibilities. See you next week.